You know, for centuries, um, God's people have found it helpful to have certain habits that they pursue on a daily basis in pursuing after God. And there are some habits that are weekly habits, like once a week in church. And there's also yearly habits. They just have a, re- a yearly uh, rhythm to them. This Wednesday night, or this Wednesday, we actually begin a yearly discipline of the church in the terms of the church calendar year. It's called Lent. It begins. It's a 40-plus day uh, before Easter. And the church has found it helpful just to insert routines that are not really found in the other aspects of the year, but just where you're, you're pursuing after God with a greater intensity. And for some folks, uh, they choose to fast. That is, they do without something, okay? They do without social media for 40 days. I'd love to see that happen. Uh, some do without television. Some do without um, desserts or alcohol. There's some folks that just for 40 days, they say, I just do without lunch. And I'll just take that time and devote it to God. Some folks get even more um, uh, energetic than that. But it's this 40 plus days uh, before Easter. It's always a very special season if we will allow it to be. Uh, It's this year, this time of year, uh, that's very special to me because it really was the time that I formalized my calling into full-time ministry. I'd always known I wanted to be a pastor, but to take specific steps of say, okay, which school do I go to? Which classes will I take? That all got formalized in this season of Lent, right before Easter. And so I'm really privileged to have pursued and to actually get to live out uh, my dream. Right now, right now, I'm living my dream. Uh, I have the privilege of knowing what on earth I'm on earth to do. Now, there's a, uh, a woman whose name is Agnes Ganje Bujaju. She's known all over the world. You know her, although she's petite of stature, unable to dress large crowds with any eloquence, and of very average intellect. World leaders would seek out her audience. The Nobel Prize was awarded to her, as was the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which is the highest civilian uh, award that American can give. In 1999, Gallup list of most widely admired people of the 20th century ranked her number one. It's Mother Teresa. She knew what on earth she was on earth to do. There's huge joy and focus and purpose of life if you know this. Paul, the apostle, speaks autobiographically in his letter to the Galatians when he says this. He says, even before I was born, even before I was born, God chose me and called me by his marvelous grace, and then it pleased him to reveal his son to me so that I would proclaim the good news about Jesus to the Gentiles. That's his life's purpose. He knew what on earth he was on earth to do. He didn't know that in the beginning of his life, but he discovered it, to know Christ in a deep relationship and to tell Gentiles as well as Jews that they can be in on this life too. One of the many things that I do not miss about living in a city that's a hundred times larger than Idlewild are stoplights. <laughs> oh, stoplights. Stockton had more than its share of stoplights, particularly those left-hand turned arrow lights. There was one of them in between my house and the, the church, and so I would encounter it every day. These left-hand turn arrows, okay? Uh, And they're timed in such a way that uh, there's about four cars that can turn left, okay? Then if you don't make that, you get to wait through the next life cycle, light cycle, which is four and a half minutes. That is an eternity to someone who is not yet redeemed in his driving skills, okay? Jesus is working on me. I'm barely a Christian behind the wheel. Ask my wife. She could say amen to that. I'm surprised it's not an audible amen right now. So when I'm in that left turn lane and I'm the fourth car and the light turned or the arrow turns green and I'm ready to go, I got lots to do. And the person in front of me has their head bowed and their hands like this. And I'm thinking to myself, well, maybe they're in prayer, but I doubt it, you know, because their thumbs are going like this, okay? 
So the less than Christian part of me says, ram them, just ram them. <laughs> You know, or we say, yeah, Bob, you've got that same idea too. Just, just you know, that'll get their attention. That'll get them off that phone and, and onto the left. So, but I'm only two blocks from the church that I pastor, so I better not do that. So instead what I do is kind of like that tink, tink, you know, just a little, little friendly tap, okay, a little double tap. It's not what I'm thinking, but it's what I'm doing. And I'm saying it's time. It's time, friends and neighbors to move forward. So this morning, your pastor is behind you going, ding, ding. (laughs) It's time, folks. It's time. Because God's arrow is green. It's green. And enough of the distractions. I'm just giving you that friendly little tap in terms of moving forward with the life that you were designed to live. God's best. And yeah, there's all kinds of distractions in this world that wants to keep you from becoming the best version of yourself, the version that God has in his mind, the dream that he has for you. So this morning, let's just stop playing church and let's actually get on with the journey of becoming who we were meant to be in the mind and in the heart of Almighty God. Marcia read from Philippians, Paul's letter there, and he said, I press on, in other words, I'm moving. Okay, I'm not stalled here. I press on in order that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Now there's a lot of kind of words in all of that that really w- I was assisted by a good Scottish reformer. His name is William Barclay, commentator, and he says this about that scripture. He says, Paul felt that when Christ stopped him on the road to Damascus, that Christ had a vision and a purpose for Paul. And all his life, Paul felt bound to press on, lest he fail Jesus and frustrate that dream. Every person is grasped by Christ for some purpose, and therefore every person should, with all their life, press on so that they may live out that purpose for which Christ grasped them. In other words, blessed are those who know what on earth they're on earth to do. Okay, you might want to hang on to what um, was said by Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain, who said, you know, the two most important days in a person's life are the day they're born and the day they find out why. <laughs> okay? What if, what if God put you on earth to actually do something that matters? Something that, that makes an impact. What if, any, what if he had you in mind before he created you, and with his help, you can become the best version of you? We only get one go around in this life. There's just one, one life that God gives us. The scripture is very clear about that. And clarifying my life's purpose in that one life that I've been given is an indispensable component of living this life well. So, let's set aside all the distractions and let's move forward with God's green light. Beep, beep. Okay? So that when we lay our head at the pillow at the end of each day, we'll do that with the satisfaction that knowing we're we're participating in the very thing that God created us to do and the people He's called us to be. And this issue of just knowing what you do with your life, it's not just for those who are, say, in high school. Wondering, what am I going to do with my life? It's not just for millennials as they take aim at a certain vocation. It's not just for Gen Xers or baby boomers as, you know, we go through life and make lots of mid-course corrections. It's for everyone. I can't tell you the number of times that I've heard from somebody who's in their 60s or 70s or 80s, Pastor, I have no idea why I'm still around. I have no idea why God put me and leaves me on this earth. You'd never hear that from the Apostle Paul. Even in his fourth quarter, you wouldn't hear it from Paul. And he gives us a huge clue in the scripture that was read for us in Philippians to help us understand why all of his adult life, he knew exactly what it was that God wanted him to do. There's three phrases that just jump off the pages that are laid the foundation for knowing what on earth 
you're on earth to do. And that is that in verse 8, he says, that I may gain Christ. And in verse 9, that I may be found in him. And then in verse 10, that I may know him. For Paul, if you want to know why you're placed on the planet, he says you need to begin with Christ, not yourself. So go ahead and take all of the personality tests that you want, but you never know where to plug in your particular personality and skills and strengths without knowing Christ. So the best version of me will not only have Christ in my life, it'll have Christ at the center of my life from which everything emanates, that his will and that his word are really what's driving what I do with my life. You see, God has a why for you and me. Why am I around? Well, I've got the answer to that why. And if I don't discover the why, uh, I'll be confused about the way of what I'm supposed to do, where I'm supposed to go. So Paul came to discover his why and his way that God had for his life, the purpose and the path for him. And he would say and tell us that the discovery of God's purpose for my life, it involves a process that takes time, okay? Two big words, process and time. Things that we in America do not like. Anything that takes time. But he could write confidently to the Galatian believers that God had designs on me even before I was born, even before that doctor slapped me and I caught my first breath, that as I look back on my life now as an adult, Paul would say I could see God's hand in everything along the way. That for Paul, he was born in a Jewish home, trained in the finest Jewish universities of the top professors, and the first 30 or so years of his life, he was fanatically devoted to advancing the Jewish cause. And then Jesus goes and upsets all of that by appearing to him on the road to Damascus, obliterating every comfort zone that Paul had every theological comfort zone that he constructed, every spiritual comfort zone, every relational comfort zone, every emotional comfort zone, it just got wiped out. As Jesus, this is my paraphrase, Jesus appears to him and says, Paul, you're trying to wipe out what I'm trying to establish. You got to do this all together differently and in an entirely different direction, sir. And it's no accident that Christ encounters Paul as he's on a journey because your life's purpose will be found in the process of a journey, a journey that takes time. And he's on a journey and and Jesus is inviting Paul to a journey, to take an entirely different journey with his life, a journey toward the purpose that God created for him from before he was born. And if I were to say something about this journey is that I will never discover the best version of me if I punch into my life's GPS easiest route. Do I need to say that again? Just don't go punching into your life's GPS. What's the easiest way to get there? Because that's not where your life's purpose will be found. Okay, Paul is encountered by Jesus on the road to Damascus. There was a believer in the city of Damascus that Jesus appeared to him too. and said, I want you to go across the city. There's a man whose name is Saul that he will change his name to Paul, but he needs your touch because he needs to be healed. And you're the instrument that I'm going to use to heal him. And he says, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. In other words, the road, the purpose that I've got for him, uh, it's not going to be an easy one. And it, it may be that the designs and the purposes that God has for you and for me, they probably will not include beatings and riots and imprisonment. But the road to discovering and living out the best version of you will not be found on easy street. It won't. So don't avoid God's best version of you just because it's going to take you out of your comfort zone, okay? So, beep, beep, okay? So Jesus will go on to tell this this believer in Damascus, his name is Antioch, the one who's going to heal Paul. He tells 
uh, uh, Ananias of the purpose that he's going to call Paul into the kingdom. He says, I want you to go for Paul. He's a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. Gentiles, kings, sons of Israel. Now, to begin with, this whole part about Gentiles and kings, Paul didn't get that. It didn't sink in, even though Jesus mentions them first. He goes immediately to the synagogue there in Damascus. And he starts preaching to the Jews. That's who he was comfortable with, who he knew. And, and he preached with such effectiveness, they put a contract out on his life. Okay? So I know that if I'm effective, I may have some trouble. But he was forced to leave Damascus. And then uh, at this point, he was really deciding to, I need to have things clear in my head and my heart. He goes for about three years into the solitude of the desert in Arabia, he, he writes to the Galatians. And then when he's done there, he goes back to the Jews, back to Jerusalem. Paul has in mind his Jewish roots. I want to lean with all of my might in an effort to try to convert the nation that, that founded me. Okay? But in Acts 22, Jesus appears to him and says, you got to get out of town because they're plotting against your life. And Paul basically, you know, he's saying, I think of anybody on the planet, I'm your man here in Jerusalem to try and convince the Jews because I know them in and out I, to reach the Jewish people. And Jesus just simply says in the scripture, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. So Paul, he goes to his hometown. It's Tarsus. It's a Roman colony. It's not Jewish. There were pockets of, uh, of Jews in the city. But for years, he lived in obscurity there in Tarsus. And then a massive revival breaks out in a, a, a town about 80 miles away. It's a big town named Antioch. And it was a predominantly Gentile city. And Gentiles are pouring into the church and the church leadership is overwhelmed, and the, and the apostles in Jerusalem hear about what's going on, and they send somebody to check it out, make sure everything's kosher, so to speak. And they send Barnabas. Barnabas is overwhelmed with joy that he discerns, boy, this is God's work. This is amazing. And so he dives into the pastoral work of just trying to, to raise people up that were brought into the kingdom there as Gentiles. There's a long way to go. And he's just overwhelmed. So he needs some pastoral assistance. It's important that you realize that he didn't go 300 plus miles back to Jerusalem to get that pastoral assistance. He goes about 80 miles over to Tarsus and gets a guy named Paul, brings him back. And so for some years, the Apostle Paul is an associate pastor in this huge church, ministering predominantly to Gentiles. And then God up and says, I want the two best of your church, I want Paul and I want Barnabas, to go into even further regions of the Roman colony to bring this gospel to the Gentiles. And that's really where Paul hits his stride. That's, that was the main focus he realized that to which his life was being aligned. And so with God's yearning to have the gospel, to, to really break out of the Jewish shell, to not only include Jews, but to Gentiles, that's, that's, that, Paul said that's the reason why I was created. That's the reason why. And the rest is history. Paul hits the sweet spot of knowing and living out God's purpose for his life, of intentionally aiming at Gentiles to join the Jews in the gospel. So folks, right now there is a God-given, God-designed purpose for your life and mine. And he invites you into the journey to discover that. And if you pursue anything else, you're going to come up empty in the end, feeling like you know, something just didn't click like it should have. So, start with God. That's what Paul found out. You start with God. You invite Jesus not only into your life, but into the center of it, so that from the core, everything else will emanate. Everything. The supreme purpose of your life, ultimately, is to know God through His Son, Jesus, 
to know him personally and intimately, as Paul wrote, that I may gain Christ, that I may be found in him, that I may know him. There's a pastor in the L.A. region, Erwin McManus, who says you can't live the life God created you to live until you give God the life you have. So give him the life you have. And if you're at all fuzzy about why on earth, you, you know, you're on earth, then let me give you a discipline that will take you um, as little as one minute per day during the season of Lent, which begins this Wednesday. Just for the next 40 days, would you pray the prayer that David prays in Psalm 25, that in a, a new translation, it's called a Passion Translation, it says this. It says, Lord, direct me throughout my journey so that I can experience your plans for my life. Reveal the life plans that are pleasing to you. Just pray that prayer. And don't just rattle off the words. I mean, pray that prayer. It's, in, it's found in your, your worship guide there. And it doesn't matter if you're in your first quarter. It doesn't matter if you're in your fourth quarter. You can pray this prayer. And you know what? If you're in your fourth quarter, let me again remind you, games are won or lost in the fourth quarter. Just ask the 49ers. Okay? The game's not over. Pray this prayer every day for 40 days until Easter hits. I mean, someone said, you know, everybody dies in the end, but why die in the middle? Or why die near the end? You know, live. Live the best version of you that like Paul it's been in the mind and in the heart of God say okay Jesus I invite you in I invite you in and I say Jesus I'm, I, I've tried to do life on my own and it just doesn't work very well and I keep getting frustrated and I keep bumping into walls I earnestly believe Lord Jesus that if you created me and you had the best version of me in mind before I even drew my first breath, just show me how it is that I might become that best version. Lord, direct me throughout my journey so I can experience your plans for my life. Reveal the life plans that are pleasing to you. Boy, that would be a prayer that's honoring God, and it'll get you to where you want to go. You want to go there? Let's pray. Lord, direct us throughout our journey so that we can experience your plans for our life. Reveal the life paths that are pleasing to you and may we walk in them. For Jesus' name's sake we ask. Amen. Amen. Let's stand as we conclude.